thanks for being here. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of things that are more interesting to do on a Sunday, but I thank you for being here. I also appreciate you holding off on your questions and comments till the end of the presentation because in all honesty, I don't have a prayer getting through this unless I can just kind of talk from start to finish. Um, I'm also going to be providing a whole lot of information, uh, a lot of charts, a lot of numbers, and my guess is that probably most people are not going to be able to remember all of it, or are they going to be able to write it all down? And we're still getting a lot of feedback here. Let me move this down a little bit or something. How's that? All right. Um, so if you want a copy of this presentation, if you want to see some of the detail, it's available at copahi.org. And you'll see that everything in the presentation is sourced. So if you want to actually dig into it a little deeper, look at some of the original documentation, um, that would be the way to do it. Um, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about some issues that aren't getting a lot of attention in our current healthcare debate. And that's the issue of cost spending and waste in the American healthcare system. Now, to be honest, I don't care if you are a Republican, a Democrat, if you're a liberal, if you're a conservative, if your health care reform plan does not address the issues of cost and waste in the American health care system, your plan is going to fail. It'll be like trying to run away from a train in a tunnel. No matter how fast you think you're running, it will catch you from behind. So the whole issue of cost and spending is extremely important for us to be talking about. Um, trying to be completely nonpartisan here. The Affordable Care Act did a number of things to reduce um, cost and to address waste in the American healthcare system. But I would argue that it probably didn't do enough. And as a result, we're seeing some of the problems with the law that we're having right now. The American Health Care Act and the Better Care Reconciliation Act, which are the two bills that are currently uh, coming out of the House and Senate, having looked at those pretty closely, I would argue that they do virtually nothing to address cost and waste in the American health care system. Now, when I talk about cost, and this is going to be a little bit of a mind shift we're going to have to make for this presentation. When I'm talking about cost, I'm not talking about the cost of health insurance premiums. As we're going to see a little later on, the biggest driver of health insurance premiums and premium increases is the cost of health care. If you don't talk about the cost of health care, to some degree, insurance premiums are like a symptom, not necessarily the cause. Um, now, one thing I really want to make sure that I make clear here is my issue with the health care system is not with doctors. It's not with nurses. It's not with county hospitals like the one we have in Delta that does really good care, employs a great deal of people, and does a really good job at low prices. My problem isn't with um, rural health care clinics that are doing everything possible to help their community while at the same time doing everything imaginable just to keep the doors open. That's not my problem. My problem is with the American health care system itself and with the market that surrounds it. If you really think about it, the health care system wasn't designed so much. It came about piecemeal. It was a system that came about action upon action. It came about incentive upon incentive until eventually we got to a point where we got into this 
inflationary cost spiral that frankly is unsustainable. And as far as the healthcare market itself is concerned, a lot of the market controls that would work in other markets in the economy either don't exist for healthcare or don't work well enough, especially those market controls that deal with the consumer side of the market. Um, there is, um, in fact, probably we might as well start with the first slide. Um, Dr. Glenn Melnick, who is a professor of health economics and finance at USC, described the healthcare system this way. He said, it's now so dysfunctional that I sometimes think the only solution is to blow the whole thing up. It's not like any other market on earth. And to be honest, I really couldn't agree more. Um, what I want to try to do is I want to try to explain, or better yet, try to imagine what another market would look like, one that you're familiar with, what would it look like if it operated like the healthcare system? Now, I'm not trying to compare products and services here. I'm trying to compare how markets actually work. Let's say that you want to buy a TV. You go to 10 different stores. You see literally hundreds of TVs. There's no price tags on any of the TVs. You have no idea how much any of those TVs cost. What's more, no one in the store, no one who works in the store can tell you how much they cost. Either because they don't know or they're not going to tell you. You also find out that the price of a similar mic of TV varies wildly depending on what store you buy it from. In short, a similar TV could cost twice as much in a store just down the road. But of course, there's no price tags on any of the TVs, so there's no way you know what those stores are. You also find out you don't actually get to pick the TV you're going to buy. The store picks it for you based upon their assessment of what you need. Now, there's one thing you know in advance, and honestly, it's about the only thing you know in advance. And that is the price of some of these TVs are so expensive, they could actually bankrupt you. Or they could do real financial damage. So if you want to avoid that risk, you really can't afford to pay for that TV out of pocket. You actually have to contract with and pay a third party to buy the TV for you because they've got a bigger risk pool and essentially they get something closer to a volume discount. Now, the first time that you know what that TV is going to cost you is about a month after it is actually delivered to your house. And that's when you start to get the first of the bills. And everything on those bills, anything that can be charged for, is a separate line item. There's a line item for the TV. There's a line item for the remote. There's a line item for the batteries that go into the remote. There's a line item for the package that goes into the box that the TV goes into, et cetera, et cetera. And to add insult to injury, if it turns out that the delivery guy drops the TV when he's bringing it out of the delivery truck and breaks it. If it turns out you plug the TV into the wall and it does about half of the things the brochure says it does, there's no refund or return policy. You have to start from square one all over again. So when I hear people in Congress talk about fixing the American healthcare system by applying free market principles, I really can't take it seriously. Because there's not much about the market that I just described that vaguely resembles a free market. In fact, I would argue it's almost the polar opposite of a free market. 
Now, I'm going to be really nonpartisan here. Democrats will say, well, you know, we can fix this problem. What we can do is we can force people to buy a TV or pay a penalty. That way, that volume discount will be better. Republicans will say, that makes no sense. Sorry, you can't force people to buy stuff. We know how we're going to solve the problem. We're going to let you buy TVs across state lines. We're going to let you put more money into something we call a TV savings account. It's tax free. You can squirrel away more of your hard earned savings in the hope that someday you might be able to buy a TV. So when you're talking about applying free market principles to a system that works like that, it's really hard to take it seriously. A lot of those ideas at best are cosmetic, at worst they're irrelevant. Now, to be honest with you, I know there's problems with my analogy. You can't compare TVs to open heart surgery. Not quite the same thing. But I'm trying to describe the market there. Um, I also know, keeping that analogy going, I don't have to buy a TV. I can go the rest of my life and never buy a TV. If I don't like the way that market worked that I just described, I don't have to be part of it. But when it comes to issues of health, I don't have a lot of choice. My life or my well-being could be at stake. I can't afford not to be part of that market. And once I get into that market, I don't have a lot of control. I don't have a lot of leverage. I can't necessarily run off to another hospital to see if I can get a better rate, which I wouldn't know anyway, because again, there's no price tags in any of the TVs. And for some reason or other, I think that Americans have come to assume that if healthcare is good, it's got to be expensive. I think we've come to accept that notion. And if you think I'm wrong about that, how many of you would really like to sign up for some really cheap health care? Sure. Well, you're one. <laughs> but let me put it another way. If Jake Jabs, the guy that owns American Furniture Warehouse, bought a bunch of hospitals, would you go? <laughs> This Labor Day weekend, 20% off on all brain surgery. <laughs> well, probably not. Um, and what's interesting about that when you get down to it is if you actually look at the studies, if you actually look at the information, once, and again, this is by procedure, by treatment, once you get to a certain cost threshold, Paying more money for health care doesn't necessarily improve the outcome. In fact, it's arguable that the more you pay, you don't get much for it because it really doesn't go to your care. It goes to something else. So, where does this crazy market lead us to? Where does this crazy American health care system, what has it done for us? Well, the biggest issue that you're going to see that we have is spending. A little bit of interesting facts here. In 2007, the US spent $2.2 trillion on health care. That's about $7,400 a person. By 2015, we were spending 3.2 trillion dollars on health care. That's between 2007 and 2015. In 2007, health care expenditures accounted, or health care in general, accounted for 16.2 percent of the economy. Now, or I should say in 2015, it's 17.8 percent of the economy. 2015, health care spending increased by 5.8%. The economy only increased by 2.2%. Health care expenditures are going up at a rate that's two and a half times faster than the growth rate of the economy. 
If the American health system was actually a country, it would be the fifth largest economy on the planet. It would be more than every economy in Europe except one. And my guess is by now, since this is 2015 data, my guess is Germany is probably second to the American healthcare system. To put it another way, the healthcare system in the United States is equal to almost 30% of the entire economy of China. That's the second largest economy in the world. And according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in six years, healthcare expenditures are going to reach $5.1 trillion. And that is 19.3% of GDP. That's not sustainable. That growth rate will bankrupt the country. And what does it mean for a family? The Milliman Medical Index said in 2016, the average cost, annual cost, of medical care for a family of four was $25,826. From 2011 to 2015, health care costs increased by 27%. In the same time frame, incomes only increased by 10.6%. That is not sustainable for American families. Medical costs for families have risen $1,000 a year from 2008 to 2016. So we have a market and a system here that when you get down to brass tacks has the potential to bankrupt the country and to bankrupt tens of millions of Americans if we keep going the way we're going. So why does healthcare cost so much? Why are the costs so high? Well, for one thing, we've got a fee for service reimbursement system. That bill that I was talking about with everything as a line item, that's what I'm talking about. Providers are paid for each service that is performed. Now, a lot of new reforms are trying to get away from that and to make this kind of system more outcome-based, but largely we're talking about a fee-for-service system. There are excessive administrative overhead. Administration is a huge, huge cost. When we talk about waste here, when we get to the end of this, you're going to see how much administrative costs actually waste in the American healthcare system. Advances in medical technology, those gizmos that cost a lot of money, certainly drive up the cost of health care. We've got an aging population, too. Guys like me, part of the baby boomer generation. We're going to be, um, we're going to be pretty high us end users of health care. The older we get, the more health care we're going to use, and the more it will ultimately cost. Healthcare market mergers and consolidations. In some areas, the consolidation of hospitals actually doesn't reduce costs. It actually makes costs go up because it limits competition. And you'll see toward the end how much it can raise costs. Also, we have a healthcare legal and regulatory environment that's basically crazy. Um, and this also, by the way, deals with unnecessary services because of issues with malpractice. Uh, high unit prices for medical service, lack of transparency about health care costs and quality, systemic waste, those three things are what we're going to talk about next. That's what we're mostly going to focus our attention on. Costs and setting prices. How do prices get set in the healthcare world? How do they come up with the price of an appendectomy or something else? Well, it depends on what part of the healthcare system you're looking at. 14% of Americans are on Medicare. So that is negotiated with the federal government. Federal government runs Medicare. By the way, for those of you not on Medicare, you still pay premiums and co-pays and it covers about 80% of the cost. Medicaid is the next bit. Now, Medicaid is a mixture. Part of it is paid for by the federal government. 
Part of it's paid for by the state. Right now, it's about 50-50 with the new health care bills that are out there. That might be a little bit different in the future. But Medicaid is negotiated by states effectively with regulation defined by the federal government. And they determine what reimbursement rates are. And by the way, reimbursement rates for Medicare and Medicaid are lower than other charges that are out there. Um, the next bit is private insurance. Private insurance covers about 56% of Americans. Uh, they get most of their health care, most Americans rather, get their health care or health insurance through private insurance companies. How is that stuff actually done? How are those prices set? They're set in negotiations between the individual insurance company and the healthcare providers. Because those negotiations are proprietary, we have no idea what those rates are that they negotiate, which the representative was talking about a little bit ago. That is a black box system. We have no idea what those prices look like because hospitals don't want other hospitals to know what they've negotiated. Insurance companies sure as hell don't want other insurance companies to know what they've negotiated. And interestingly enough, to show you just how weird this market is, guess who has the highest charges? Guess who pays the most? It's the uninsured because nobody negotiates for them. So what does this black box system led us to? This is a really interesting little chart. According to the Institute of Medicine, that the price of other commodities had increased at the same pace as health care costs. Between 1945 and 2010, a dozen eggs would now cost $55. A gallon of milk would cost $48. A dozen oranges would cost $134. That's what would happen if we had those costs growing at the same pace as health care costs increase. The cost of hospital services has grown faster than any other part of the health care system. From 1997 to 2012, the cost of hospital services grew by 148%. That's 10% a year. By contrast, the cost of physician services grew by 55%. In 2012, one day in a U.S. hospital cost $4,300. That's three times more than what you'd pay in Australia 10 times more than what you'd pay in Spain. You might ask, are we getting three times the value? Turns out not so much. The Commonwealth Fund in 2013 did a healthcare scorecard of developed nations. Uh, US is on the right and Australia is on the left in terms of overall ranking. In 2013, Australia ranked fourth, we ranked 11th. In terms of overall quality, Australia ranked second, we ranked fifth. Australia spent $3,800 per person on health care. America spent $8,500 on health care per person. Now I want to talk about insurance. Um, as the title says, healthcare spending is the major driver of premium increases, and I'm going to show you to what degree. This is the premium increase across the United States. It's the average across the U.S. And this was for the individual and small group markets. Individual markets where you buy insurance yourself, you don't get it through an employer. Small group market is small businesses, businesses that are like 20 people, 15 people, that kind of thing. On average, premiums increased between 2015 and 2016. They increased by $25.26 per month. Now, by the way, if you live out here on the West Slope, you'll know that your premiums were a lot higher than that. 
But that was the average. Notice that 69% of the premium was due to health care costs. 69% of that increase was due to hospital outpatient, inpatient, physician, and prescription drug spending. Now, there's two parts to this when you're talking about health care costs. Number one, how much did those costs increase from 2015 to 2016? The other thing that affects all of this is what they call utilization. How many people are actually using health care? If more people are using health care and filing more claims, that's going to increase what the insurance company has to pay out that will jack up premiums. Now, in the individual market, it's almost impossible to know what the utilization rate is, whether it increased or decreased or stayed the same. The reason why is people bounce into the individual insurance market all the time. But if you look at employer-sponsored insurance, PricewaterhouseCoopers does something called a medical cost trend for employer-sponsored insurance. They say, in no uncertain terms, in the early 2000s, price and utilization contributed to the growth in healthcare costs. Since then, the use of services has declined and higher prices are driving the growth. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, it's the cost of healthcare, not utilization in the employer insurance market. Why? Because deductibles have gone up. Defined benefit plans, more co-pays, bigger co-pays. The use of health care has actually dropped. But if you take a look at that chart down there, the bottom line is utilization. You'll see that only a couple of times does it go above zero. But if you look at medical price, that red line at the top, it's always at 4%. It grows 4% basically every year. Now, by the way, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, roughly half of employer health care costs stem from hospital inpatient and outpatient services. I spent 25 years in the private sector. One thing we had very little control over was the cost of health benefits. It was a big chunk of our budget. I can tell you right now, I was in a company that had about 500 employees in it. And bottom line is, those health care costs affected what we were going to pay you in salary. It affected what raise you were going to get. If we had a big jump in uh, health benefits costs, your salaries and your raises were going to suffer a little. And by the way, if you happen to be a small business, it may be the difference between whether you hire somebody or whether you don't. Health care hits you in ways you don't always recognize. Down at the bottom, in 2007, health care costs added $1,525 to the price of every General Motors car built in the United States. That was added to your sticker price. And in that year, General Motors spent $4.6 billion on health care. That is more than the company spent on steel. And by the way, um, just to show you that this stuff does get personal. This is a letter I got from my car insurance company. And they're telling me how they're going to jack up my rates. And interestingly enough, one of the four reasons for my rates going through the ceiling are, quote, double-digit increases in health care costs are driving up medical costs related to accidents. This translates to higher insurance rates. Bottom line, folks, you pay for health care in ways you don't always know. It's not just all about premiums. All right. There's another part of all of this. And this goes to what the representative was talking about. How do the prices for similar procedures vary from hospital to hospital? <coughs> I think you're going to find this kind of interesting. There was a study that was done. It was published back in 2012. It was called Healthcare as a Market Good Appendicitis as a Case Study. 
And what they did was they looked at the state of California and they were trying to find out how much uh, an appendectomy would cost from hospital to hospital. And it wasn't just any appendectomy, it was a straightforward appendectomy, what they referred to as uncomplicated appendicitis treatment. Now, to qualify for that, the patient had to be between 18 and 59 years of age. You didn't want complications from really old people or babies. And you had to be hospitalized for less than four days with a routine discharge to home. This study found that the prices for that procedure varied from $1,529 in a local county hospital to $182,955. That is a heck of a range from lowest to highest. Now, by the way, I don't want you guys to focus on the $183,000 thing. There was one of those. That was an outlier. I mean, it's kind of interesting that somebody would actually charge $183,000 for an appendectomy, but don't let that overstate the problem. What I think is more interesting is the median charge in California for an uncomplicated appendectomy was $33,611. You had a county hospital that could do this for $1,500. The median price was $33,000. That is a variation in price of 2,100%. And that's to get to the median. Now, one of the things that's a big deal in healthcare pricing is, ge is geography. Uh, you pay more for some things in other places than others, right? You go to Lodi, California, I bet whatever you buy there, you go to you know, downtown San Francisco, it's going to be a whole lot more expensive, right? Well, they tried to factor in geography. They tried to look for the county that had the least variation in prices. It turned out to be Fresno County. And even in the county that had the least variation, the lowest to highest price still varied by $46,000 for this uncomplicated appendicitis treatment. 68% of the variations could be explained according to the guys who did the study. 32% had no explanation at all for how those rates were so different. Another really interesting thing, this is for the, the Delta County Hospital folks in the audience. County hospital charges were 36.6% .6 lower than nonprofit hospitals. And for-profit hospital charges were 16% higher than nonprofit hospitals. So it kind of made a difference where you went to get your appendix taken out. There was another study also done. Uh, they had some additional uh, cost ranges for different procedures. This is in California from 2007. Hysterectomy charges ranged from 3,500 to 65,000. Gallbladder surgery ranged from 2,700 to 36,000. Colonoscopy screening, that's just your basic colonoscopy, went from $350 to $5,800. What explains those variations in price? Why the difference? Now that's California. Let me show you Colorado. A little closer to home. Uh, sorry, I've got to explain this a little bit. This data comes from the Colorado Hospital Association. This is a report that they did back in 2012. Now, that's a little old. The reason why I picked 2012 was that was really the last year that the Colorado Hospital Association provided an unambiguous average charge for what they called minor severity treatments or procedures. Minor severity treatments or procedures means the following. It means there are minimal complications it means there are minimal secondary diagnosis. This is about as simple as you can divide it down. These aren't like really complicated procedures versus uncomplicated procedures. This is mostly price variations between procedures that are basically relatively uncomplicated. So what I did was um, I, I got four hospitals on the left. They're the ones in blue. Valley View and Glenwood, Delta County Hospital, 
St. Mary's in Grand Junction, Aspen Valley, Denver Health, St. Joseph, and Sky Ridge. So you got Denver on the left, sorry, right, and you got West Slope on the left. Look at how prices vary for what they call a minor severity appendectomy, since we were just talking about appendectomies. Delta County, $16,000. The highest price, Sky Ridge and Littleton, $42,000. Now, no two appendectomies are alike, I grant you that. But at the same time, these are minor severity procedures. You'll also notice, by the way, as we go down through this, and we'll go through this fairly quick, You'll also notice that the prices in Denver for these seven procedures across these seven hospitals, you'll notice that the prices for those procedures are lower on the West Slope than they are in Denver. Now that begs a really interesting question. Why are premiums so high out here? Don't know I got an answer to that one, but it's a rather interesting question. Gallbladder surgery varies from $16,000 in Delta to $60,000 at Sky Ridge. Now, by the way, you'll notice that the green and the red, green is the low price and red is the higher price. One thing that helps to describe some of the reasons why Delta and um, uh, Denver Health are lower priced, they see a lot of Medicaid patients. Medicaid patients have lower reimbursement rates. So if you see a lot of people on Medicaid, those rates are going to be lower than for other hospitals who don't see as many Medicaid patients. So that's part of the explanation of why there's variation. COPD, as you can see, uh, $18,000 in Grand Junction, $22,000 in Aspen. St. Joseph Hospital in Denver is almost as expensive as Aspen. Not exactly uh, a low-cost place, Aspen. C-sections. Again, you see differences in prices there. Uh, hip replacement is kind of interesting. Uh, if you take a look at Aspen Valley, $65,000. Sky Ridge is $90,000. What explains that variation in price? What I think is really important that we have to start talking about is pricing transparency. What the representative talked about. I mean, right now, it's really hard to compare these prices. Uh, Colorado Hospital Association will say, well, you know, no two surgeries are alike. That's true. I don't know if that necessarily explains these variations in cost. They say that if you have a complicated surgery in your hospital, then you need more equipment, more fancy stuff to do complicated surgery with. You need more resources. That costs more. Because that costs more, that also drives up the cost of those simple surgeries because you're paying for the whole deal, right? Potentially true. You've also got the issue that, and this is really interesting to me, why, um, it, it turns out that hospitals don't necessarily calculate charges the same way. Some hospitals can include physician charges, others don't. So that's another reason why these prices could vary too, but that I think argues more for why isn't there standardization in the way these charges are calculated? Maybe we should do something like that. All right? Drug prices. Yeah, I heard the moans out there. Let's talk about drug prices. I'm talking prescription drugs here, by the way. Yeah, I'm just saying. In any event, the U.S. spending on prescription drugs has increased by 67% since 2004. It's projected to increase by another 64% over the next eight years. And by the way, if you look at that uh, orange part of the bar, that's Medicare. Look how those prices are going up or how that spending is going up and the prices necessarily. Part of that is because we have an aging population. They're going to be using a lot more drugs. To me, that chart is a really good argument for why we should be negotiating drug prices for Medicare.
Now, this is an interesting one. This is a really wild example. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is because it's really an outlier. KV Pharmaceuticals back in February 2011 got exclusive rights to market a drug called Makina. It's a shot that's given to high-risk pregnancies to reduce the rate of premature birth. Well, February 2011, as I said, KV Pharmaceuticals got the exclusive rights to market that drug. The price per injection was originally $10 to $20 went about $200 to $400 per pregnancy. After KV got exclusive rights to market the drug, the price of that shot went up to $1,500. Now, this created a big stir. It created a lot of press. Doctors' organizations said, that's crazy. You can't do this. The March of Dimes got involved. This was hitting all the papers. And the FDA did something very unprecedented. They said, you know what? We're not going to let you do this. We're going to let pharmacies do these drugs, and you are not allowed to sue them. That was really unusual. But you know what's really unusual? We heard about it. If KV Pharmaceuticals had only jacked the price of their drug up by 500%, we wouldn't have had the press. FDA wouldn't have taken that action to make sure that the drug was still sold at original price. Probably nothing would have happened. We keep hearing about things like Martin Shkreli. We keep hearing about things like EpiPen. What about drugs in general? You know, if these guys would simply not jack up the price of their drugs so high, <coughs> would it get very much attention? Well, in 2016, Government Accounting Office report said that while the average price of generics had come down, 300 generic medications had at least one price increase of 100% or more. We didn't hear about those. 15 generic drugs had seen price hikes of over 1,000%. And even more interesting was insulin. Prices for insulin have skyrocketed, even though the drug hasn't changed that much. They're not huge advancements in insulin. Yet, if you take a look at the, the slide up there, between 2010 and 2015, the recommended wholesale price of different forms of insulin Increased, from, increased between 127 and 325%, even though not much had been done to the drug. Between 2012 and 2015, the wholesale price of the most popular insulin increased from $258 to $1,100 for the average patient. One last thing on drugs. Pharmaceutical companies keep saying it takes a billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. If you actually look at the studies, it turns out that the average actual scientific research and development cost for a new drug is somewhere between 43 million and 125 million. A lot of money, but a long way from a billion dollars. And pharma never really talks about how much of that billion dollar estimate is for testing markets advertising and promotion. And look at the way that drug advertising, direct-to-consumer drug advertising has increased. It's rose from $166 million in 1993 to $4.2 billion in 2005 to $5.6 billion in 2016. My guess is that advertising and marketing has a lot to do with those price increases. All right, last thing I'm going to talk about before we get to uh, what some of the solutions are now that I sufficiently depressed you with what all the problems are. <laughs> I want to talk about waste. Uh, in my mind, waste in the healthcare system is one of the biggest issues out there. Um, you might be a little surprised by all of this. Um, Institute of Medicine, 
in 2012 produced a report. Back in 2009, the U.S. spent $2.6 trillion on health care. According to the Institute of Medicine, 30% of that amount, $765 billion, could be classified as waste. Waste they defined as overuse, inefficiencies, fraud, and other activities that do not improve health. But the pie chart's what's interesting. $210 billion, according to the Institute of Medicine, was for unnecessary services. A lot of that has to do with malpractice, by the way. $130 billion was wasted because of inefficiently delivered services. Prices that were too high accounted for $105 billion of waste. Excessive administration, which I talked about at the start, that excessive administrative overhead cost as much as $190 billion, all according to the Institute of Medicine, classified as waste. $75 billion in fraud, misprevention opportunities, $55 billion. Studies in 2011 put it at, because this was back again in 2009, by 2011, studies were saying that we were wasting anywhere between $558 and $1.2 trillion. If that 30% number, which is kind of the median for these figures on waste, if that's accurate, then in 2015, when we spent $3.2 trillion on health care, $960 billion could potentially be classified as waste. I want to put that number in perspective for you. The bank bailout in 2008, that was $700 billion, and that was one time only. That wasn't an annual thing. The defense budget in 2015 was $598 billion. In 2009, we wasted $765 billion. And this one probably bothers me the most. I don't have kids, but it still really bothers me. Um, fiscal year 2012-2013, local, state, and federal governments collectively spent $620 billion on K-12 education. We waste more money in the health care system than we spend on, on educating our kids. And I'll throw one last one at you. It's not up there. The American Health Care Act, the House bill that was just passed, that's the only one so far that's been scored by uh, the Congressional Budget Office. According to that score, that bill, if it became law, would reduce the federal deficit by $119 billion over 10 years. That's $11.9 billion a year. That entire bill on a yearly basis would represent 1.2% of the amount of money we waste in health care. I don't think we're solving the problem. And in trade, according to the CBO, we're talking about 23 million people kicking off, getting kicked off insurance. Waste is a big deal. So this is the last part of the presentation now because I know some of you are going to absolutely want to go to the restroom. Policy solutions. What can we do about this? Well, the first thing I talk about is pricing transparency, once again. No matter what direction you want to take, you need to know how much this stuff costs, and you need to justify and understand why it costs what it costs. No matter what you do, no matter what reform plan you want to take, first and most important thing is pricing transparency. Now, by the way, I don't necessarily think that pricing transparency is all that good for consumers. I don't think they use it. Uh, pricing transparency laws in California sort of show they don't. The main reason is, you know, if I get a pain in my chest at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to run out and do comparison price shopping. Right? <coughs> We think about health care, it costs in terms of how much we pay in premiums. Maybe we've got a doctor who says, if you want this surgery, you've got to do it at hospital X, Y, or Z. I'm not sure that consumers 
are going to use it. I think they should be allowed to if they want to see it. But I don't know that that's going to really change the picture in terms of cost. What I think the value is, is the different audiences. The fact that you could talk to employers, physicians, healthcare plans, the fact that you could talk about, you know, policymakers in Congress and like the representative here today, trying to find out how much this stuff costs. <coughs> Drug makers and hospitals have to be more upfront about what they charge and why. I think it's absolutely important. Another thing, the antitrust laws to get rid of big hospital conglomerates. In some areas, some of these studies show that conglomeration, consolidation of hospitals in some areas can jack prices up by 10 to 40 percent. There is a really good bill out there in Congress right now. It's called the Fair Drug Pricing Act. It is a nonpartisan thing. It is sponsored by John McCain and Tammy Baldwin. That's about as bipartisan as you get. They would basically require under this law that drug companies just annual uh, justify annual price hikes over 10%. If you want to call your legislator about a good bill, that would be one. I think it would be really nice to negotiate Medicare drug prices. The VA does it, seems to work pretty well. Here's another bill that's going to happen. It's actually been introduced this year in the Senate. Again, John McCain, Amy Klobuchar. It would allow the importation of drugs at lower prices from other countries, providing that those drugs and those processes are vetted and regulated. Not a bad bill to support. Allow the FDA to reform drug patent process and promote pharmaceutical transparency. Malpractice reform so that we don't spend as much money on unnecessary procedures. Here's a big one. Fee schedules and national price negotiations. Germany, Japan, Belgium, all set national fee schedules. By the way, Medicare does that too. We do it here. We just don't do it for everybody. Um, turns out in those countries, prices are far lower than they are here. Why? Because nations have more negotiating power than an individual or an individual insurance company. And the other thing it does that would be nice for a lot of folks um, who don't like the idea of single payer, for example, national fee schedules don't eliminate private insurance. Doesn't eliminate a competitive industry. Opponents of this will say, you know, we don't like this because, God, if we talk about negotiations between the government and all these other entities, that's going to be crazy. Let me clue you. That negotiation process in terms of what they pay and how they set charges is pretty crazy right now. And also, universal health care is single payer. And by the way, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that single payer means literally single payer. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean like in Denmark or the UK that you have state ownerships of hospitals or healthcare infrastructure. Given the political environment we have now, I'm sorry to say, I don't think any of these things have a chance of happening. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get them done. But I think given the current political environment, the chance of this kind of thing or any of these things really happening, it's probably pretty low. Well. Drug lobby is pretty strong. I don't think they're real fans of the Fair Drug Pricing Act or importing drugs from other countries. So what we should also consider is what to do at the state level. And this is the last bit, and I'm going to rip through it pretty quick. Pricing transparency again. California has done more things on pricing transparency than any other state in the union. They've made a lot of mistakes, too, which means you can learn from what they did wrong. And there's no problem with the state doing things related to pricing transparency. Establish state-based goals for cost growth. Publish health and cost outcomes so you can track progress. Adopt payment and delivery systems through the Medicaid uh, programs in each state so that you can tie things to quality and value instead of fee-for-service. 
Implement a bundled payment system for all payers so that you don't pay for every little thing. You pay in one lump sum for what you do. Global budgets for hospitals, allowing nurse practitioners to do more things out in rural areas with their provider shortages. There's a great thing that California is doing that's called indexed institute, um, sorry, it's called reference pricing. And they do it in their state employee plan. They brought costs down substantially, and they haven't done anything to reduce quality. It's a real success story. Those are some things we need to do at a state level. And here's part of the reason why, and I'll end with this. Keep in mind the Affordable Care Act probably never would have seen the light of day if it hadn't worked well in Massachusetts. If you want to do something out there, one way that you reduce the risk at a federal level is to implement it at a state level and to get it working. If you can prove in practice that you have done things to improve the situation, it makes it a lot easier for federal legislators to do something about it. So don't underestimate what you could do at a state level. So anyway, um, that's the presentation. And if you've got any questions or anything, uh, Comments to make? Now is the time. <laughs>